So in this video, we take a look at the concept of data structures and arrays. So first of all, what actually is a data structure? Well, it's a specialized format for organizing and storing data. And you've been using a number of them already, things like arrays, lists, files, records and tables. You've actually been using very basic data structures ever since you first started a program in the form of characters, strings, integers, reals and booleans. You already know that a string is a collection of alphanumeric characters, whereas a char or character data type is a single character. Although you use the string data type behind the scenes, it's actually a data structure made up of a series of separate character data types. There are many much more complex or what we call higher level data types and you'll start to be exposed to lots of these at A level. But they all work in fundamentally the same way in that they allow you to organise and store data in a certain way following certain rules. So an array can be thought of like a variable which can contain more than one data item. For example, we could be storing a list of names. And we can do that by allocating a continuous part of memory to storing that data. So you can see here, we have a number of memory locations in memory and starting at memory address five, we've then started storing contiguously a list of names which will be part of our variable. Note that lists, which are probably what you might be familiar with if you're programming in Python, are different to arrays because they're not contiguous. But for the purpose of your exam, you can think of arrays as storing contiguous data items. So our program will know where in memory our array starts, in this case, address five. And we can therefore use an index relative to the start point to allow us to easily access the array's contents. So notice arrays are typically zero indexed, which means Jane is at index two, not index three. It is in the third position in the array, but because we start at zero, it's at index two. So we're gonna use some code example here from Python. Now, just a quick note, Python does actually use arrays, but it has methods that allow them to be used like lists by a programmer. And that's why most people think Python only supports lists. But this little extra level of complication is beyond the spec. For all intents and purposes, at GCSE, you can effectively think of lists and arrays as the same things, although that's not strictly true. So here in this code example, this line sets up a one dimensional array of strings called countries. It assigns it some initial values, Angola at index zero, Austria at index one, and Belgium at index two. And again, note how the indexes typically start at zero and not one. To output Austria from the array, we would therefore need to use index one, as index one represents the second item in our country's array. Arrays are a static data structure, and that means you can't change the size of them once you've set them up. Now, this is a good example of where Python is allowing the array to behave like a list. Although you can't tell because this has been abstracted from you, Python is actually moving the entire data structure to a new part of the memory to ensure it's contiguous. So with Python, we can insert an item into the new location at the end of the array using its index. So here we've added Canada to the third index or the fourth position in the country's array. You can also have two dimensional arrays and you can visualize in your head a two dimensional array as looking like a table where we now need two sets of indexes, one to index the rows and another to index the columns. So to access Angola, you'd be going to index zero, zero as shown here. 
countries 0, 1 contains the integer 1, 2, 4, 6, 7, 0, 0. And countries 1, 1 contains the value 8, 3, 8, 7, 1. So let's just recap what we've covered. An array is a static number of related data items that are stored together in the same memory space. Each data item has to have the same data type. And the particular data item, the element, is found using the index for the array. Indexes usually start at zero for the first data item, known as a zero indexed array. And arrays may be single or multi-dimensional. You can visualize dimensions as a column when it's a single dimensional array or a table where it's a two dimensional array. Now, a quick note and something which is often asked by students and teachers, that when we say index one zero, we could be accessing value one one two. It depends how you actually choose to store the data behind the scenes. There's not a fixed way of referencing the data in array. You don't go, for example, always down the X axis and then the Y axis. It doesn't matter when you visualize rows or columns first, as long as you're consistent in your program. So read the questions carefully in an exam so you are sure which way round the data is being stored. Now that's where the specification stops, because in the exam you only need to know about one-dimensional and two-dimensional arrays. If you're interested to know about three-dimensional or higher-dimensional arrays, then you can watch the rest of this video, but there's no need to take notes. And higher-dimensional arrays is something you'll probably cover at A-level. So you already know that you can visualise uh, as an abstraction a one-dimensional array as a simple column and a two-dimensional array as a table. Well, it doesn't take much of a stretch then for you to realize that a three-dimensional array in your head could be visualized as a cube. You could reference any item in a three-dimensional array by giving three index values, one for the height, one for the length, and one for the depth. So here we're accessing two, two, two. We're going down two, across two, and two rows deep into our cube. Now, at that point, people think, well, surely we can't go higher than a three-dimensional array. How could we represent a four-dimensional array? And although that can be a difficult concept for us to wrap our heads around, because we live in a three-dimensional world, a computer doesn't care about that. It can easily have a fourth-dimensional or fifth-dimensional or higher-dimensional array. And actually, it's not that hard for us to visualise, even though we only live in a three-dimensional world. So this is how you could potentially visualise a four-dimensional array. We just take a set of cubes. We'd have to supply four indexes to this array to access any one of the elements. The first index specifies which cube we look at, and then the next three specify the width, the depth and the height. In a similar manner, we could carry on visualising 5th, 6th, 7th and higher dimensional arrays, although this does get a little confusing. So here we have a 5th dimensional array with one suggestion of how you could visualise it. You'd have to supply 5 index values to access any particular element in a 5 dimensional array. The first two here could be telling us the row and the column 
of the cube to access, and the final three, the row, column, and depth of that cube. Now, it's unlikely you're ever going to be dealing with five-dimensional arrays, even at A-level, but it just shows how computers are not really limited, and we can often take concepts to the next level quite easily once we understand some of the basics.